How are Greyhound bus lines, Vienna sausages, Dial soap, and Mickey Mouse related? We're going to find out on today's episode of Transit Tangents. My name's Lewis. And I'm Chris. And yeah, uh, we're going to see how all of those things are related. Um, before we get into the Vienna sausages and <laughs> Dial soap and Mickey Mouse, uh, I actually don't even know all of the details of this. Chris has done a lot more of the research on this one, but uh, so I'm excited to find out with you. Uh, but we're going to start off by kind of discussing the inception of intercity buses yeah. in the U.S. The real topic of the episode yeah. is intercity buses. Yeah. For sure. This is the bonus, you get the bonus fun <laughs> fact uh, mixed in as well. <laughs> and though this episode is going to come out, uh, I think at a later date, it is worthy of noting that we are filming this on the 4th of July. And what is more iconic American lore than uh, taking a bus across the country? Yeah, no, I mean, it's a, it's a fun thing to think about. I've driven across the country more than once at this day. I think I've done it four times now. It's a, a journey in a car, but man, doing it in a bus is, uh, that's, I've not done that. That's rowdy. But people used to do it all the time. And Miles in Transit still does it today. There's an amazing <laughs> video. We arrived in Pittsburgh 25 minutes late. There's a bit of a stir right now because no one's issued reboarding tickets, yeah. which is just a classic like Greyhound thing, I feel like, just to not get them. As it turns out, we didn't get reboarding tickets because the bus from Pittsburgh to Columbus had been unceremoniously canceled. Mm. Pittsburgh to Columbus. Which we were doing anyway. Forty forty to St. Louis. St. Louis. St. Louis to L.A. Oh, great. Wait, we're going to L.A.? Yeah, apparently. So intercity bus travel in the U.S. really goes back to about 1914. Uh, prior to that, there was definitely bus services within cities. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times, I mean, if you think back, these were like omnibuses that were pulled by stagecoaches. <laughs> Uh, then eventually something that was a little more motorized, um, you know, motorized stagecoaches, that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. But we really started to see uh, this uh, concept of going city to city by um, bus in 1914. Right. And that started with Carl Eric Wickman, who was a Swedish immigrant to the U.S., and was a Hupsmobile salesman. Mm -hmm. And for, if you don't know what a Hupsmobile is, think of like a very old timey car. Uh, that's pretty much it. We'll, mm -hmm. we'll throw up some photos of it for people to see. Um, but he was a Hupsmobile salesman, but not a very good one. Mm. And so he had seven cars that he was supposed to sell and he couldn't sell them. So instead, he'd drive the cars back and forth between Hibbing, Minnesota to the local mines, taking miners back and forth and charging them about 15 cents per ride. Huh. Realized he can make some money on it and then started uh, expanding his business <laughs> into uh, more uh, regional travel. Gotcha. Yeah, and I mean, up until this point, like rails were the main source of getting between cities. Uh, buses, obviously, like the car had kind of just been invented not long before this. So the idea of buses getting there, there was no interstate highway system at this point. Right. So uh, city to city travel was definitely done by rail at this point. This is long before uh, the system of passenger rail in the United States was basically gutted because of uh, yeah. the interstate highway system and everyone getting around in cars. So, so in 1928, uh, the Yellowway Pioneer system uh, was the first actual way to get from one side of the country to the other. They established the first route that would get folks from Los Angeles all the way to Philadelphia. And it was in a different way than Greyhound does their kind of cross-country buses today. You actually transferred multiple times between city to city to city to city to city, basically. Yeah. It was a collection of all of these intercity bus routes that would go from you know, LA to Las Vegas, and then there might be one from Las Vegas to Salt Lake City, and then one from Salt Lake City to Denver, and then, you know, and, and maybe smaller cases and, and whatnot throughout. But it was the first way to go all the way across the country, the first kind of use of transfers with buses. Um, and it covered a total of 3,400 highway miles, and it would take five days and 14 hours to complete that journey. I don't know exactly how many transfers, but definitely a journey. But that is Okay, so that's wild because on one of our episodes way back, um, we talked about how cool is it to say way back? Way we have, back. We have so many episodes, we yeah. go way back. Um, but on one of our episodes way back, we talked about the 1919 uh, Transcontinental Motor Convoy. Mm -hmm. And this is the famous convoy that President Eisenhower, well, not President then, but um, a young Eisenhower uh, was a part of. And they were testing to see how far uh, or how long it would take the military to go from one side of the country to the other. This was in 1919. So nine years before this uh, inner city bus mm -hmm. route, it took them 62 days. Wow, so in nine years, the, the you know infrastructure improved enough uh, to get the time from 62 days to 
five and a half days, basically. Yeah. That Wild. is pretty impressive. Yeah. Yeah. Yellow Way Pioneer, they had come up with this system, and then our good friend Carl Wickman uh, decided that was such a good idea that he wanted to purchase that company. So his, uh, his company had expanded into the American Motor Transportation Company, and then they purchased Yellow Way Pioneer. Um, a few years later, they adopted the name Greyhound and put the running dogs on all of their buses, and inner city travel uh, from one side of the country to the other was born. And, you know, even today we still see that logo on buses, although, uh, you know, maybe not as many as we used to, but, uh, but they're still around. Maybe not, but we see those more than any other bus. That's so. fair. Yeah. 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 Uh, so moving on in time a little bit, uh, the 1920s, 30s, and 40s, we started to see a lot more standardization uh, of the system, especially within Greyhound. Uh, the buses all started to look the same. They'd be ordering them all to be, you know, the same format, the same look inside, outside. Um, and you also had the creation of the American Bus Association, which kind of helped along with that. Yep. Um, beyond that, this is when we started to see the development of the U.S. highway system. So this is not the interstate system yet, but uh, it was the most uh, connected series of well-maintained roads to get you between city to city, which really helped make it so that uh, the buses could run on a much more reliable schedule. Yep. The roads were going to be much smoother, paved, all that sort of stuff. And this is what we talked about in one of the previous episodes um, about uh, tolling, mm -hmm. where in 19, 1920s, the federal government um, really went on this huge highway expansion. <laughs> right. Yeah. And, and the, all of this stuff really made it so that buses were now becoming competitive with rail. Uh, and in some cases, small towns that were not connected to rail we're now actually able to connect into the greater system of now intercity buses as well as into the rail system. Whereas before, you know, expanding a railroad into their town might have been really difficult to do, but to establish a bus route that goes there was a much lower barrier to entry yeah. for those communities to kind of get connected to the rest of the country. Because of that flexibility mm -hmm. uh, and lower cost of barrier for bus lines, by 1934, uh, Greyhound was the largest uh, bus carrier in the country. They were carrying approximately 400 million wow. passengers per year. And that was just about uh, as many passengers as the Class 1 railroads. Wow. So the railroads that were taking you across the country, Greyhound was, was basically just as large as the railroad companies. And that is absolutely crazy right. that they grew that fast. Right. And, and that's a major shift. And I mean, uh, you have to imagine that the, the convenience of being able to get closer to your final destination probably helped in the sense of like a lot of towns not necessarily being connected. Yeah, um, yeah that's that's a huge shift. Um, and then it's actually interesting because uh, about 1934 is when Greyhound really surged in population and the Greyhound company will attribute that to a movie that came out hmm. uh, in 1934 called It Happened One Night. Uh, it was about an heiress who traveled uh, by Greyhound uh, with a reporter who was played, play, who was played by Clark Gable. Uh, and it was such an immensely popular film that people saw bus travel as this sort of romantic way to get from city to city. And it, it absolutely took off. That's hilarious now because, uh, I mean, we just took a bus. We'll talk about this a little later on. We took a bus from San Antonio to Austin the other day. And... Uh, Romantic is not the word that I would use to describe it. <laughs> it was fine. That's fair. It was fine. Yeah. Not romantic. No. <laughs> uh, moving forward, though, uh, the 1940s to the 1960s, I mean, things really, really took off for, for uh, Greyhound in a major way. Um, in 1941, uh, Greyhound actually purchased Greyhound Canada. Um, and well, go ahead. Oh, there's a funny story yeah. about that. Greyhound Canada was not part of Greyhound. Greyhound Canada was a collection of other bus companies uh -huh. that had really started in like the northwestern part of Canada. Uh, and they just, they saw the success of Greyhound in the U.S. And they said, well, that's a good name. <laughs> we'll just take the name. Right. Yes. And Greyhound like sued them multiple times and like, you can't do this. And finally they were just like, we'll buy them. Screw it. We'll buy you. We'll buy yes. Them. Yeah. Um, but I mean, that that is a major uh, benefit as well. I mean, now you have connection into your neighboring country to the north to right. be able to connect uh, cities, especially like in the Northeast, there's a lot of close proximity between mm -hmm. cities like Toronto and Buffalo and uh, Montreal to Burlington, Vermont, and down to you know New York City and Boston. And I'm sure that at the time that was a major benefit yeah. uh, of those routes. We're gonna jump right back into this episode in just a second, but first, if you have not liked this video, go ahead and do so. Also leave a comment. We love reading all of them and respond to as many as we can. Uh, and be sure that you are subscribed so that you catch every episode as they come out. 
Please share this with your friends. And if you don't have time to watch YouTube videos in the future, you can catch us on any of the podcast platforms that are out there. Uh, just be sure to leave us a rating and uh, give us a comment. Moving into World War II, uh, bus travel again had this major upswing in uh, passengers, and that was largely because gasoline was being rationed. So you needed to fit uh, way more people into one vehicle. Uh, you needed more efficient ways to get people across the country. Uh, so buses were the solution of the time. Uh, so during this, this uh, World War II era, huge boost to Greyhound and other companies uh, like Trailways, which mm -hmm. we'll kind of talk about in a minute, um, the two big competing right. competing bus lines at the time. Um, once you get into uh, the post-war, all of America was really booming. We had this massive industrial complex. You had all of the, the GIs coming back mm -hmm. and buying homes in suburbia. And uh, suddenly you had these um, sort of dense suburban pockets that had previously been serv serviced by trolley cars now being serviced by uh, bus lines too. Right. And that's like a lot of cities across the country. You know, you might notice that there were rail routes in some areas, these like streetcars and whatnot. Uh, most of them in a lot of cities were removed. Uh, here in Austin, I, you know, there was a, a small streetcar network that was removed. Um, and yeah, it was just, they were removing them and putting them, putting, you know, city buses in mm -hmm. place in, in a lot of cases. Um, but yeah, I mean, interesting to hear about like Trailways. So like there was a big competitor and Trailways was a, a another kind of like network type mm -hmm. one. It was a bunch of regional providers all working together. Over a hundred companies. Yeah, over a hundred. Huh? Sorry. <laughs> You're good. Uh, yeah, all working together. And it's kind of funny. I feel like I still see the Trailways name mm -hmm. used on buses today. Um, so while uh, Greyhound eventually did purchase the largest of the Trailways companies, uh, Trailways still exists in some form or another today, yeah. I believe. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think they're still around. I remember being a kid and I think taking a Trailways <laughs> bus. But the thing is, a lot of those, uh, the companies that still use the Trailways name, mm -hmm. they do mostly charter services. Right. Okay. So I think anytime I took a Trailways bus, it was um, like we'd go to the zoo in another city mm. uh, for school trips and that kind of thing. Gotcha. So, okay. Yeah. Yep. Um, but yeah, but, I mean, we really did see a lot of consolidation start yeah. to happen towards the end of this era, though, where... Uh, you know, there was a lot of competition and it started to kind of narrow down and narrow down and narrow down. Um, and this was really the golden age of bus travel in the mm -hmm. U.S. I mean, think about any type of like movie that was set in this time frame in the 50s, 60s. Uh, they usually involve some type of bus. I mm -hmm. think of Forrest Gump sitting at the bus stop. Right. Telling his entire life story at the bus stop. <laughs> <laughs> um, this is also when Greyhound had their uh, iconic buses out. They were the the scenic liners, I think they were called, where it was very streamlined and they were all silver and they had the hump in the back. Mm. So like you would actually go in and have like sort of like an Amtrak car today. You'd have right. like a little observation area in the back of the bus. Um, just really s iconic symbols of America uh, during this time. Right. Unfortunately for... Greyhound and regional buses in general, though, the golden age did not last a an extremely long time, unfortunately. Yeah. As we moved into the 70s, 80s, 90s, uh, obviously, you know, uh, the automobile became even more accessible than it already was. Uh, families across the country were sprawling further and further out into different suburbs. Uh, and it becomes, as we've talked about on this channel multiple times, more and more difficult to serve these areas by transit and that includes some of this inter-regional transit as well because if you live really far away from the stop in the middle of the town you're going to have to take a bus to get to the bus you know yeah. the, the further away you are from where these pickup services happen the less likely you are going to be to use it so yeah. um between the rise of the automobile becoming even more uh, accessible to folks the interstate system the interstate system made it right you can now yeah. drive everywhere so much faster yeah. Um, airlines really were taking off as well. I mean, it was easier and easier to fly across the country mm -hmm. to different places. So those longer routes were no longer necessary in a lot of cases, even though some of them still exist today, even though I think that that's insane, <laughs> as we've talked about in the Amtrak uh, episode yeah. as well. But um, yeah, it was it, there was lots of different forms of competition that frankly were way more convenient for folks in most yeah. cases. I think the interstate and airlines, those are the two things that sort of killed the buses at this mm -hmm. time or were slowly killing them. Um, yeah, like you said, interstate system, huge, really easy to get from city to city now. Um, but around the 70s is when the airline industry was deregulated. Mm. And so there's a lot more competition that popped up. Uh, they were able to sort of cut prices and um, people suddenly saw an affordable way to get from one side of the country to the other that wasn't sitting on a bus for five days. Right. Uh, yeah. So airlines were a huge, huge part of it. 
Uh, and about this time, we had <clears throat> the energy crisis as well in the 70s. So some fuel, fuel prices did go up, which uh, if you're running a big gasoline-heavy industry, mm. that's also going to, to hurt you a little bit. Um, but with all of this, Greyhound saw the writing on the wall uh, of... of <laughs> of uh, our, our revenues are going to be declining, people are relying on these other services, and so they thought, we really need to diversify. Mm -hmm. And this is where we opened up, where this just went off the rails for me when right. I was researching this. Literally off the rails, because these are on the roads. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, this went off the road as well. Um, in 1970, Greyhound purchased the Armor Company. Uh, if you're not familiar with uh, the Armor Company, it was one of the largest meatpacking companies in the country. It's like one of the top five meatpacking countries right. or companies. Um, not a good company. Mm -hmm. All throughout the 1800s, horrible, horrible labor relations, right. horrible accident rates, which is great for a meatpacking company. Right. Oh um, terrible, like like union busting. Um, but also in the Spanish American War, they were responsible for thousands and thousands of soldiers being food poisoned oh for selling God. rotten meat to the u.s <laughs> oh, God. like not a great company <laughs> right maybe they got a deal i don't know greyhound they must have was, gotten yeah. a deal yeah, yeah, yeah. uh so greyhound bought this company they wanted to diversify well <laughs> armor also had a breakout uh pharmaceutical and cosmetic division okay and their breakout star product was dial soaps damn which was like the first mass-produced antibacterial soap in the country uh-huh and so they had this huge profit maker of dial soaps and Greyhounds like that. I want that. That's what's gonna. That's what's gonna help us survive. What a random pivot too. It like yeah. it's not even really related. And I mean, I guess kudos to them to like if you're trying to keep your bus network afloat at least for a period of time, you use these other things yeah. to kind of supplement the costs. But like. <laughs> wild that's like whoever was making those decisions i mean I, again I, they probably at least prolonged it so that they were able to keep things going longer here and yeah. obviously the greyhound still exists but yeah definitely interesting absolutely yeah. wild so yeah you had inner city bus travel a company that packaged vienna sausages and dial soap right all together under one umbrella wild yeah wild. um and eventually, what's actually kind of a funny uh, pivot off of that is, is Dial Soaps eventually separated completely from the companies, mm -hmm. uh, but they were still under the name Greyhound. And it was much later they realized they had to change their name because investors and consumers were really confused, and they had a, a call-in line to the Dial Soaps, and people would call in asking why their bus was delayed. <laughs> and so The soap people are just like, I don't know. <laughs> Sir, this is, this is soaps. This is not your bus. And it, it, it got even crazier, too. Uh, in 1984, they decided to get into the cruise industry. Yeah. Um, that's, that's interesting. They ended up actually operating the official cruise line of Walt Disney World for a while. Yep. Um, they bought the Premier Cruise Line, and they ran it for multiple years until it went bankrupt. Yeah, uh, definitely a, a, an interesting track record of, again, I mean, I, I appreciate the the thought process of trying to diversify a little bit to keep your, you know, maybe they're using that money to keep their core business going, knowing that intercity buses are going to need to stay around and yeah. they need to subsidize them somehow. Um, interesting that they were just doing it on their own with soap, sausage, and cruises. Soap, sausage, um, and cruises. Yes, yeah. <laughs> it was a wild time. It was a wild time for the companies. Uh, and again, we were talking about Greyhound, and this is supposed to be about inner city bus travel as a whole, but mm -hmm. Greyhound is the dominant force <clears throat> right. in inner city bus travel up to this point. And mm -hmm. we'll talk about the modern era in just a moment, but uh, up to this point, Greyhound dominated the space. And so if even they were like, we have to diversify into all these other options, right. like you know this is not a good time for the industry. Right. Um, as we moved into the late 80s and the 90s, you also had a lot of bus driver strikes, which affected the company um, pretty heavily. You had a major antitrust mm. uh, lawsuit against okay. Greyhound because they were sort of forcing their uh, the, the providers of the stations and cities to only sell their bus tickets, mm. and so you had all of this this stuff going on, um, which really was uh, hurting the company until about the late 1990s. Mm -hmm. They got a new CEO, and then they started to look at okay, how can we fix this horrible brand reputation that right. we have now and really start to turn the, the company around. This is also after uh, a bankruptcy or two. So a lot of turmoil happening in this industry at the time. Yeah, absolutely. And and kind of moving forward as well, I mean, in the 2000s, we saw a couple of new players enter the space. Uh, Megabus, which I've got some personal experience with on a couple of occasions. Bolt Bus. Uh, there's a lot of like regional ones too. Mm -hmm. I, I know in the Northeast in particular, uh, I haven't ridden some of these ones, but like you see Peter Pan... 
Uh, Chinatown Express or Chinatown Bus. There was that was a big brand. Yeah, and then I mean, even I've uh, there's a lot of like at least in New England regional ones. You've got like a couple bus lines that operate throughout New Hampshire, Maine, Massachusetts. Um, so I, I, that's just ones I haven't experienced with. But a lot of new players kind of entering the space uh, in in the 2000s. Um, and at and, this time, this is when Greyhound was also being purchased by other companies. So like right. Bolt Bus, for instance, was a European company mm -hmm. that also had purchased Greyhound. Gotcha. So 1990s, bad time. Uh, we start moving into the 2000s and bus travel actually starts to come back up. Mm -hmm. And a lot of that has to do with uh, the way the companies sort of turned around. They got a lot of investment from uh, European companies. Megabus was a European company. They mm -hmm. actually operate, they're, they're Scottish, I think, and they actually operate buses and trains and a couple other things. Mm -hmm. um, Bolt bus, same thing. They operated uh, multiple types of transit in uh, Europe, and then they came over and, and helped with Greyhound. Um, and Flixbus as well mm -hmm. is starting to make a debut in the, the late aughts uh, into now. Uh, into now, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And that was a German bus company, mm -hmm. um, which again, we'll talk about them in, in just a moment as well. But as we move into uh, the 2000s, uh, bus travel starts to pick up. And there's a couple of reasons for this. Mm -hmm. um, some of those are uh, technological advances uh, with the advent of the internet and the wide adoption. People are able to um, book buses online. Uh, after 2008, we start seeing smart apps or smartphone apps mm -hmm. uh, for you to be able to um, just immediately, you know, look at a schedule on your phone. Right, without needing to call a bus station right. or exactly. figure out. Yeah, a, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Yep. Uh, you also, I mean, they they advertise at least that you have Wi-Fi on board, uh, <laughs> so they trick you into thinking they have it, and many times they will yeah. have it, but it just don't work. Um, but, well, so do the airlines. <laughs> yeah, true. The true. number of times they get on an airline, it's like, and sorry, folks, the Wi-Fi on this plane doesn't work today, but yeah. you can watch movies. Yes, here you go. <laughs> um, so you had that sort of stuff. Uh, a lot of good, at least. PR uh, is as far as you know using intercity buses is better for the environment because yeah. you're not all taking your own individual uh, car trips. I guess I say it's good PR, but it's it is also makes sense if you're not all taking your own individual car. Uh, you're burning less fossil fuels and whatnot overall. Yeah, um, and then just kind of a shift in in perception among younger generations. Yeah, uh, millennials have been accused of killing many, many things. We've been accused of killing fabric softener, mm -hmm. uh, the institution of marriage, mm -hmm. golfing. <laughs> <laughs> but one thing we haven't killed mm -hmm. uh, is the Greyhound bus line, or, or bus lines in general. Bus lines in general. Uh, millennials have a very different perception of public transit and uh, just getting around, and so we're going to look for cheaper options. And I think one of those reasons is that uh, you know about the time that millennials were really coming of age uh, was when we had the 2008 financial crisis. Mm -hmm. And one thing that has sort of played out multiple times in the bus industry is that whenever there's financial hardship on the country, buses <laughs> tend to sort of go up uh, in ridership because people are looking for cheaper, cheaper alternatives uh, to get around. So right. in 2008, we actually did see a boost in bus ridership because suddenly it was more expensive to take uh, an airline and people were looking for options. Right. Yeah, on the like financial element of it, uh, I have like a decent amount of experience taking Greyhound, but a lot of megabuses. And mm -hmm. the reason I was taking a lot of megabuses was because it was a time frame where I had like just enough money to like kind of sort of travel, but like finish my travels with no money in my bank account. Uh, and I took a couple overnight megabuses uh, on different trips, partly because then I didn't have to pay for a place to stay that night either. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, yeah. But but like mega bus tickets for a while at least, you could get them for like ten bucks, twelve yeah, bucks. Really cheap. Um, you know, from and like even over longer distances. I did a, an overnight mega bus from Vegas to LA at one point, LA to San Francisco, um, for crazy cheap. And they were not always like the nicest experience. <laughs> um, you know, you had a plug that was like. Yeah. A nice that was the that was the amenity. Yeah, basically was that you had a plug, but I oftentimes found them very crowded and like you know uh, it just it it wasn't it wasn't great. Um, yeah. I, I also have a decent amount of experience taking some kind of like regional buses too. I mentioned earlier on like the bus bus services in New England uh, being able to like use them to get to the airport or something um, to get, cover further distances. And, and I'm actually going to be using a bus in the next like two weeks going from Portland, Maine down to Boston as well. Yeah. So, uh, there's still, still plenty of applications for them. And like, are they the nicest thing ever? No. Uh, but as long as you're not doing a super, super long distance one, I have primarily found them to be fairly reliable yeah. on timing and whatnot. 
Um, and yeah, I mean, it's not luxurious, but it gets the job done for a lower price. Yeah, absolutely. And it, they are starting to target different sort of income brackets too, because leading up to COVID, um, you had things like Flixbus, mm -hmm. you had the Greyhound, you have uh, Amex, which takes you down to Mexico from here, mm -hmm. um, but you all in Megabus. But you also had things like um, the Von Lane, right, which really took off in Texas and, and some other regions where it was like a luxury bus. Right. So they went for like the luxury business traveler mm -hmm. making these short. Yeah, and it's like a h higher price point, bigger yeah. seats. They actually have Wi-Fi that works probably. Yeah, they have plugs, um, all this. I think they even have like food service and stuff. Yeah, on yeah, them. they yeah. have like a little, like yeah. a stewardess that goes up and down yeah. the aisles. It's, it's um, actually pretty nice. I have not one, done one of those. Yet. Yeah. That's nice. Have you done one? Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Um, but yeah, and then post COVID, all of the bus lines, uh, a lot of them went out of business, mm -hmm. and you've seen a, a lot of struggle. Um, but apparently, they are on the upswing again. So we yeah. will see. Maybe in two or three years, we'll be back at like the pre pandemic level mm -hmm. uh, of, of bus service in the US. Right. But in this uh, post pandemic world, mm -hmm. uh, we, we go and look back at the previous years of revenue for bus services. And we'll take Greyhound for an example. Mm -hmm. uh, CNBC, which does amazing transit related content. For they, some reason. Yeah. For, for some reason. <laughs> Somebody there is a big transit nerd. I love it. Um, but CNBC re uh, did a video about Greyhound and they talked about the uh, revenues year over year. Mm -hmm. And in 2018, Greyhound had a revenue of $912 million. Fast forward to pand post pandemic in 2021, they had a revenue of $422 million. Right. Literally more than cut in half. More basically. than cut in half. Yeah. Um, um, which must have led to Flixbus, the German company, mm -hmm. purchasing all of Greyhound. Right. Uh, and now today, I mean, with that, we're kind of seeing like dual service. You're still seeing Greyhound service, but you're also now seeing dedicated Flixbus service on different routes, uh, kind of all, all across the country. Yeah. Um, another interesting thing that I had no idea. Now their revenues are split very interestingly, yeah. and it's split between passenger service and other sources, including yeah. some of the like shipping and whatnot. But passenger services only make up fifty five percent of Greyhound's revenue. Yeah, which is insane. The rest is soap and meatpacking. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> no, the rest is other sources, which uh, Greyhound has for a long time uh, also had a package delivery service where mm -hmm. you can ship sort of bulky items across the country for very cheap, way right. cheaper than UPS or FedEx. So the next time somebody asks you how Dial Soap, Vienna Sausages, <laughs> Mickey Mouse, and Greyhound, Greyhound. are related, uh, now, now you know. Now you can go back um, and reference this video. Yeah, so th there's a bit of a, a history for you on intercity buses in the United States. Uh, at some point, we can dive deeper into different areas and where they might be you know, more beneficial or not. Um, but that gives you a little bit of an overview of the history uh, going forward. Yeah. Um, if you haven't liked this video already, please consider doing so. If you're listening, uh, please consider giving us a five-star rating or leaving a comment if you're able to do so where you are listening. Uh, thank you all so much for watching. Uh, we really appreciate it. And enjoy the rest of your Transit, Transit Tangents Tuesday. Tuesday.